Welcome to the Alphaman Podcast, hosted by Stephen Goldstein and Mark Randall. The podcast which is always looking to help traders, whether they're new to the game or whether they are seasoned and experienced traders, explore how they can be better, more productive, more effective traders by looking at the human aspects of trading performance. Before we get into the podcast, long-term listeners to the Alphaman Podcast will be aware that we have a very highly valued partnership with the Society of Technical Analysts, who are a globally renowned education institution that has been at the forefront of helping traders, analysts and system developers hone their technical analysis skills for over half a century. Thanks to this collaboration, we are thrilled to extend an exclusive benefit to our listeners who can obtain a 100 British pound discount or its equivalent in your local currency on their superb technical analyst home study course. This comprehensive course has an option for an internationally recognized diploma and has been created by some of the leading experts in the fields of technical analysis. The course is designed to profoundly enhance your skills and knowledge and delves into a wide array of price action techniques methods and aspects. The knowledge can prove invaluable to traders, investors, analysts, quants and system developers, offering fresh perspectives for deciphering and interpreting price action, sentiment, liquidity and many of the aspects around those including the underlying human behaviour which goes into these aspects. You can visit our website at alpha-mind.net and scroll down to the Society of Technical Analysts section to find a link with more detail how to take advantage of this offer. Now on with the podcast. Happy New Year to all the Alpha Mind audience out there. Welcome to our first Alpha Mind podcast of 2024. And I am delighted to be interviewing my erstwhile host, Mark Randall, who is going to be reflecting really on uh, on some of the past podcasts and in, in a way which might help you prepare as a listener and a trader or even as just someone who's got a, a business that enjoys listening to the sort of things we talk about, um, to be ready for the year that's coming so you could be more effective, more productive um, in whatever you do. So, Mark, welcome. Welcome to the podcast. Well, a very happy New Year, Stephen. And congratulations to Steve, who's become a grand grandfather just recently for um, having a son, well, a grandson called uh, Mason Joe, I understand. Looks like a boxer. So uh, I'm sure you'll be nice performance time, yeah. coaching him for so long. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, I thought it, we thought it was going to be worth having this sort of banter between us of, um, you know, New Year. Um, and perhaps, perhaps to start off with this concept of a New Year, New You, which is, you know, what you've got through Christmas, you've got, you survived New Year, and you're now looking to approach the year ahead with, uh, uh, you know, with the most optimal state of yourself to you know, fight the challenges that have come your way. And I think one of the recent podcasts, um, Louisa and Nicola, uh, we had on, re- really summed up some of the things I think uh, we should all be thinking about. Now, she went to, went into the depth of you know, thinking about your blood, so maybe even getting a blood test. And I'm not going to suggest that, but some people might. Um, but, you know, the physiological state of ourselves, I think, is something that we need to take perhaps more for granted. We need to not take for granted and have more of a plan for. So even like, you know, multivitamins and supplements and ha- having, you know, that approach just to get your base right, I think is important. Um, my son was having problems with um, with certain types of eating and we, we did a allergy and an intolerant, in, uh, intolerance test for him and you know, he was lactose intolerant. And so that is something that um, he then adjusted his diet and found, found himself with a lot more energy. So I think anything to do with the gut is really, really important because the gut is an extension of brain with the vac- with the vagus nerve. And we know that the gut uh, has got something like 200 million brain cells in it. And I think making sure that you've got a good gut is, is important. So some sort of intolerance um, test, I think, which you can do for like 150 quid, is something that's quite important, I think, in part of this physiological state, understanding what might be making us feel sort of lacking energy, what may give us some degree of pain, um, you know, and the gut can do that. I think it's a really good start. So think about your physiological state, uh, do a blood test if you want, but I'd say, you know, make yourself set up with multivitamins and appropriate supplements as well as good diet. And, of course, if you were looking into the performance world of sport, 
sports people at the upper end will be looking at that same thing. You know, how do they create the right supplement? Uh, what what fluid intake do they they take on board? How do they rest? How do they recover? And having a plan for that. And I think that's something that all of us in this performance space, which we really see trading as, it's important that we should think about those things at a fundamental level of us just you know, maximizing our, our opportunity as just a person. Um, and of course, we may be getting held back by intolerance or upsets because of what we eat, what we don't eat, what we overeat. So that's my starting point. My starting point is, yeah, get your physiological state right and have a plan for rest and recovery because that is part of the performance sequence. You're going to need to rest and recover at some point. And, of course, that includes getting a good breakfast, having the right balance, work-life balance, having, you know, don't just work, work, but get get out, um, you know, use of meditation. We've spoken several times about Really, really important for many of the people at the highest level of their game to include that as part of your profile of managing and setting yourself up for the performance that's yet to come. So that's my first point. Physiological state, think about it. Okay, I'm just going to cut in there because, I mean, again, I just want to re- re- re-emphasize, you, you're referring there to this podcast we did in November with Louise and Nicola. Um, and, and I do urge you, if you are listening to this, to, to bookmark that one and go back to listen to it, if you haven't, simply because we, we, we've had so many people sort of come back to us and say what a great podcast it was and uh, how great it was to hear Louisa talk. Um, and you're going to be starting your new year off. And she talked about this synergy of fitness, nutrition, wellness and trading mastery. And, and like Mark, like you said there, Mark, you know, trading is a performance activity. We, we, you know, we can very easily get caught into this thinking that it's about system, it's about strategy, it's about finding um, some sort of signal in the market. But it, it's it, it's about that. But if you're not right, you are not going to do any of that right. You are going to be suboptimal on how you do that. You know, if you're suboptimal yourself you know, rubbish in, rubbish out, really is what you're saying here. Precisely that. Um, I think it's fundamentally important to start off with that as a New Year message. Get, get it in your diary and, um, you know, sort yourself out, so so to speak, because, you know, you may not feel an initial benefit, but over a course of multiple months of fine-tuning, uh, fine-tuning yourself with these uh, approaches, you'll start to see a significant benefit and just how, perhaps even as to how you think, you know, clarity of thought, speed of response, uh, even attitude to things, you know, where I think in this state you're you're you're, you're more in the present to be able to perform rather than um, and, and noticing if if you've delved into a sort of negative time traveling state into the past and revisiting, you know, particularly bad bad areas of performance. I think if you stay in this state of just awareness of what's going on now then you're going to be protecting yourself from that 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 negative mental drift that we can often get into yeah and, and louisa emphasized this that there's, there's a there's a symbiotic relationship between your physical well-being and your cognitive performance mm-hmm. and, yeah i mean you know, kind like of sweet. Sweet. sorry that it, it's interlinked it's you know we're complex as, as as a species, right? So everything is so interlinked, and if anything is out of balance, it unbalances everything else. Yeah. Do you know? Do you know what I find? And this is really interesting. And I mean, I, I still find this with me today. If I don't step back occasionally, I forget to start doing this stuff. Hmm. So, so there's a lot of self management involved in this. Yeah, I think step step back to some extent is letting letting go of a certain period of time as well, you know, and being willing and being knowing that you've got to step back yeah. is also fits into what we talked about in terms of letting go. And and perhaps, perhaps I'll reflect back to Tom Canfield, you know, when Con, Tom Canfield, one of our previous podcast guests, and I think he, he almost broke the internet with his podcast, yeah. one and two, with ourselves. Um, and he had a a heart attack, you know, a heart attack as a consequence of dropping a significant amount of money 
in a very short amount of time. And I always remember when he talked about how he dealt with that, and part of it was relocating. Um, but he, he actually said at the time, and he said that he deliberately didn't read any self-help books because he, he was his mates were telling him, read a self-help book, kind of find out how to manage yourself. He said, no, what, what he did was that he got himself lost into a novel. He started reading novels. And I think that's a, that's a very interesting way yeah. of letting go from, you know, it's almost like a self-help book. It's almost like you're back at work. Whilst a novel, a novel is sort of, it takes you on a journey and you, you go somewhere mentally and you're in the story. Um, something that Ken Long talked about is, is the, you know, the storytelling, the power of storytelling. Well, if you can use a novel to be thinking yourself as part of the observer of a story, which is how it feels when you get stuck into a novel, you kind of can't wait to pick the thing back up again to get back into the story. I think those things for Tom were really, really valuable and um, really, really important for him, you know, to get himself back to even thinking about trading again. So I think you know, it took, he, he, he took himself out for a while, didn't he? Uh, after, yeah, after yeah. such an experience. Yeah. But he let go and moved on by doing something different that, that wouldn't have been expected, which was actually getting himself engrossed in literature uh, and the storytelling of literature and the power of that. Um, and that's an interesting lesson too. So, you know, for people that are facing difficulties, getting yourself lost in another world, you know, by reading books, is also something I think is very, very powerful and perhaps, you know, understated. Okay. Okay. All right. So what was your 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 next point you want to let, let's move on a little bit because that was brilliant that Louise and Nicola. Well I think um, you know we're talking about trading and the, the smart the, the smartness of trading and trying to work out how to trade and we hear so many versions of it, right? We hear so many versions of what smart trading looks like. I think Oliver Kale's story, Oliver, Oliver was um, uh, victory in stock trading, strategy and tactics of the 2020 US Investing Champion book yeah. by Oliver Kale. So young fella, but a real fresh attitude. It was a while ago we had this podcast, but there's some things in there that really resonated with me that his observation of the market was, was really, really logical and obvious. And I just thought, why hasn't anyone else thought about that? Was that he would watch a market that, that had gone into bear mode, equity mode. So he's watching a, a portfolio of stocks. And he would notice the stocks that didn't go down as much as everything else and viewed those as the, the buy-in opportunity. So he'd be buying stocks that didn't tank as much as other stocks because when the market rallied again, and of course we know that stocks... You know, there's always this tendency that they, they, they suddenly find themselves going back up to new highs um, on a pretty regular basis that most people predict against if we look at the last few years. Um, but his strategy, the ob observing the things that don't fall as fast as everything else and buying them, I thought that that's a very, very good strategy. Now, I'm not telling, I'm not, this is not an investment piece of advice, by the way, but that was just the way he played his game. And I thought, that was that was very smart because of course if something doesn't go down as much when it does start to rally those things may go up more than the other stuff that was you know that gets hit massively but i like the approach this sort of level of curiosity of just noticing it was a really simple approach if you just look at it and it wasn't technical so it wasn't it was just observing and just having some sort of method of spotting well, that's not fallen. Yeah, that's only down 0.5% when everything else is down 8%. I'm interested in buying the thing that's down 0.5% rather than buying the things that look cheap at 8% down. Because actually when it starts to bounce, those things that are only down a little bit might have more upside energy when it does start to bounce. Yeah. I mean, that's an interesting plan. I like that. You know, it's it's interesting because we're, we're going back, I think it's about 18 months now to when we had Oliver Care on. Um, and and something really stood out for me about that interview. Something you you, you haven't really mentioned yet, but you know he he. I mean, let, let, let's just state that he was the twenty twenty U.S. stock trading champion. He returned mm -hmm. almost a thousand percent. Now, obviously, twenty twenty was a bit of an incredible year, and, and you missed a few trades too, right? Because we grilled him on that, and he said, "Yeah, there's, I could have done better." <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I mean, we we could always do better. Yeah, but. 
you know, it, it was an amazing year for trading stocks, you know, but he he almost doubled the second place return, the return of the mm. person in second place. Um, but the one thing that really stood out for me that stands out with a lot of people that, you know, I, I talk to in this world of coaching that we do is what he said he was highly risk averse. Mm. And, and, you know, most people listening to that were thinking, would have been thinking, I should imagine, oh, this guy's returned nearly a thousand percent in a year. He's won the stock trading championship. And yet he calls himself highly risk averse. Now, the reason that stands out for me is, you know, when, when, when I coach people, you know, I do this psychometric mark, the, the risk type compass, which yeah. actually yeah. we had an episode on that a couple yeah. of years ago as well with Jeff Tricky, who created the tool. And it, 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 it wasn't quite pigeonhole, but it, it, it puts people in a, you know, in, in one of three brackets as either risk averse, highly risk averse, highly risk seeking or risk tolerant and then somewhere in between is is the other one of those two and most people would go would think well why why would someone who's risk averse be you know good at trading so th this is the thing we actually have a relatively even balance of people whether they're risk tolerant risk averse or risk you know somewhere in between um, and i think we actually have slightly more risk averse people than any other group um, now, what, one thing I think there is that risk averse people are more likely to survive the learning journey. Okay. A lot of risk. Yeah, I think there's patient. They tend to be patient, don't they? They tend to choose, choose more carefully. Well, I, I, I don't think they're more careful, but I mean, I'm, I'm a very risk averse person. Um, and as a trader, you know, I, I think in my early years, I wasn't as risk seeking as some of the people around me. And I saw some of those people around me get taken out because they oh. were trading at a level where they weren't quite ready for yet. It, yeah, yeah. it was like we were all learning boxing and these guys decided they're going to step in the ring with Mike Tyson. And, yeah. and we decided yeah. to stay up with, with boxers at our own level. So as we kept learning. Um, so that's kind of what I think happens to a lot of people. They get taken out. They, they overplay their um, their hand too early. and it's a big learning journey trading it takes many years um yeah, so, so, like I mean, some people might just might just have called it lucky yeah but eventually eventually everyone gets taken that down somewhere there's always a trade with that you know that big loss with your name on it somewhere um and, and if you've if you've spent more years learning and having those experiences and surviving them you build up this resilience this ability to manage that and to be better prepared for it and to to come back but if, if your entire capital gets taken down on year one of your career because you've decided to put everything on red you're in trouble so the, the risk averse trader is less likely to do that yeah and who was it who was it that said that um you, he has an, he has the appropriate amount of risk on so he can sleep at night that's garth yeah wasn't it? Who, who was that who it was, was garth that? i think i think it was garth We've actually had quite a lot of people say things that are similar to that. Yeah, exactly. I, 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 always, had my, I always had my sleep rule. If I can't sleep at night, I shouldn't be in this position. Yeah, exactly. When, when I traded. And in fact, some of my biggest risk, probably the biggest risk I have on, I slept completely as calm as I could possibly be because I, I was just very comfortable with it. Um, I had my risk parameters set around it. Um, and yet sometimes I had small trades on and I couldn't sleep and it was, it was just telling me that I shouldn't have it on. So, yeah, so we've, we've gone back to Oliver, but it was just that, you know, I, I think the thing he had is that he had a deep humility that, that and a huge respect for risk and the market. Yeah, he was, it, and it, it wasn't, he wasn't egotistical about it either. He was just very balanced, very controlled, very sensible in the way he spoke, very mature for his age, I thought. Um, yeah. But an interesting approach. And I think that that book is out there, Victory in Stock Trading, Oliver Kell, uh, and listen to the podcast, of course. And, and of course, to, the other person that this drifts into... Just to remind people, that was episode 91. Was it? We, I Christ. think we're at about episode 120-odd, aren't we? And that yeah, was Christ. May 2022. If they do want to go back and listen to Oliver Kell again, 
Mm, um, absolutely. Yeah. Big lessons there for the people that are looking. And of course, maybe people listen to this, I guess, beginning their journey. And uh, we have this, this, this huge, huge curated database of some wonderful things that people can learn from. And of course, you know, start with episode one and work your way through. Um, <laughs> the other one, of course, recently was um, Jason came back, Jason Shapiro. Um, yeah. And, you know, I guess, you know, The Contrarian and The Unknown Market Wizards book, for, for those that have read that series. Um, but one of his phrases was, you know, be wrong and make money. Just, just be comfortable that, you, you, that wrong is okay. And if, if you're comfortable about that, then you'll end up making money uh, and look, look to be wrong. He said, do you want to make money or do you want to be smart, which he meant right? He said, you can't do both. No. Most people want to be right, which means they don't want to make money. Something along those lines. Yes, there's that, there, there were several phrases there. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and of course, his um, fade, fade, don't trade. That's the other one. Fade, don't trade. Fade, don't trade. And, and he was um, also quite in telling of um, you know, just just be careful who you listen to and who you follow. You know, you can listen to the big news channels and you follow, follow them, but he says, God, they've been so wrong. Um, and if you look at the UK press, you know, a number of times the UK press has forecast a, a recession in the last three years or the housing market was about to go you know, bare. And yet the reality hasn't been anywhere near those things. In fact, I don't think we've had a technical recession in the UK since then. Um, and I think it's important to check your channels in a way that actually you know start to build up your own observation of the market which very much what jason was doing um and, and look at stuff from a macro point of view but but look at things like the uh, cft report of you know the balance of positions in the market and know when the market perhaps is overly long and that's perhaps when you need to start to, to buck the trend so very much a contrary thinking approach but again it was, I think, refreshing to guess to have him on. And there have been two episodes, one, one just, just recently and uh, one a while back with Jason on. And I think, again, for those that are looking to sort of build up some viewers on how to approach this world of trading, both of those episodes are very insightful. And just his attitude. Mm, yeah, I mean, he, he was brilliant. He, he, you know, he's got this thing that, you know, it, it, it's sometimes it's, it's more about the positioning of the market than the interpretation of the news, or at least the interpretation yeah, exactly. of the news exactly. in alignment with the, you know, often the news, the, the story is fully out there, you know, and yeah. it's fully discounted. And, the, yeah, the, and, and you know, I, 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 as you know, I've got a book coming out, a little plug, okay, um, just in a couple of weeks' time called Mastering the Mental Game of Trading, little plug. Um, but you, you reminded me of something. I talk about this idea of rightness in the book i might have set you up for this by the way <laughs> yes yes one of the things i did is I, I i i've got this chapter chapter 18 which is called the map is not the terrain um mm -hmm. which really just sort of gives you this sense that you know even when you're seeing it in real time doesn't necessarily mean that's going to happen okay um, and I, I, I showed an example. So I've got a, a betting slip, which I, I had on my phone, a picture. I wasn't able to use the actual picture of the betting slip in the book for copyright reasons, but I, I, I was able to represent it. And it, it was the, the betting slip was from the date of the UK EU referendum on the 23rd of June 2016. Um, for those of you who, who may be, we, we realise that some of the people who listen to this might already be too young to remember that event. Um, um, it was, it was. should we stay in the EU? It was a referendum, a national referendum in the UK. Should we stay or should we leave the EU? And it took place on the 23rd of June, 2016. And this betting slip was timed at 14.56 in the afternoon, just before three o'clock on the day of the referendum. Okay. And the odds in favour of staying in the EU, okay, right, implied, or at least the, the betting odds implied that the probability of the UK 
voting to stay in the EU was 81%. And the probability, therefore, of Britain leaving the EU on the day of that vote was 19%. That was what the odds implied. And as we all know, you know, less than a few hours later when the referendum polls closed, Britain had voted to leave the EU. And that that betting slip was based on the polls, of people's feeling, of the way the news was reported. All of that gave that impression that we were almost certainly going to stay in the EU. It, it just shows how difficult it is to predict anything, even in real time, even when you're that close to the event. You know, it's so very you've got these things it's in the market. Where the yeah. market is voting. That, that's what the market is. It's a vote on what should the value of anything be. That's why that betting slip is so important. That was a yeah. an, an yeah. educated guess by the entire population of Britain who were betting on the outcome, doing that price, creating that price. And that's what every single price is in the market at all times. It's an estimation of value based on the collective opinion of tens of thousands, even millions of people on anything. And yeah, and how, how big was the market move the next day when the reality clicked in? <laughs> I mean, God, yes. Yes. It uh, was, uh, so clearly yeah. it, was, it was as, as per... But per that, that, that's a microcosm yeah. of what we're trying to do all the time in this For job. Anyone, yeah. yeah. You know, I, I had a client last year, a coaching client, and, and this is why we talk about this idea of rightness, the ability to let go of being right or wrong, which is why you, I think when you talked about Oliver Kerr and you mentioned his humility, that's what people mm. who have, who are very humble, are able to do. You know, you, you can make a call and you can be completely wrong and you won't be owned by admitting you're wrong or it didn't work out the way you are. But often we, our ego gets caught in that. Yeah, it's 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 fascinating, but I, and I think that Jason, you know, inferred that there's an awful lot of people that are just going down the wrong road with the way they're looking at the market by believing everything they hear, everything they read, and just basing their views on that. Um, now, some of that might be true, but there's an awful lot of it that's just somebody else's opinion. Um, and so, keeping a track of just how successful that opinion has been is what he does. You know, he just said, I don't follow that person anymore because everything he said is. It's done the opposite, but actually the opposite is quite useful for him because that allows him to then think about setting up for the uh, uh, opposing trade so long as the other bits he looks at sort of coincides with that. Again, it's we're not talking about technical analysis or, any, or algos or anything. We're talking about an observation of the market and making a choice as to what you tune into. Um, and, of course, part of the tuning in might be you because <laughs> you might be tuning yeah. into your own fabricated story. Um, and part of that might be, you know, compromised by past experience. Um, and I think I, I want to drift into Chris Camillo at this point. Um, yeah. You'll recall that Chris Pamillo, Camillo was, was very much tuned into the physical observation of human activity, you know, even noticing that there were queues outside certain shops and paying attention to what that meant in terms of determining in. Uh, what you know, what a strategy might be. Again, we're not talking about technical. We're talking about someone just bothering. I think bothering is a big word, right? Someone bothering to actually put the extra effort in to pay attention to watching things, and then watching them a bit more closely and thinking, hmm, that probably then means that all this other stuff's going to happen, and there's a strategy there for me to get involved with. Um, and again, Camilla was in the Unknown Market Wizard as well, and there's a lot to be learned from, from, from that book. But again, it's kind of similar to Jason. S -s -s not the same, but there's a similarity of intelligent observation with a degree of editorial giving you insight as to what might just happen next. Yes. With a degree of perhaps the odds skewed, perhaps reasonably in your favour, to make it a worthwhile strategy long term. Um, 
And of course, you can listen to our pod. Did we get Chris on? We did get Chris on. Of course, we got Chris, Chris on. Brilliant, brilliant, man. And Chris, very similar well, was a to Jason. Podcast, yeah. very, two, two, two things about those two, Chris Camillo and Jason Shapiro, as well as both being featured in Market Wizards. Their process was interpretive. It yeah, wasn't. Precisely. They used nonlinear data. Yeah. Okay. So we, we, we love, everyone loves to look at a chart. You know, it's a real, it, it's that. It's, it's it's price action, it's continuation data, you know, it's 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 very pure the price action. But what they were doing was looking at stuff that's kind of unpure. So the the the, the for Jason, you know, in his crowded market report, they look at um the commodity um the the commodity, CFTC. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the commitment of traders report. Yeah. And and then he interprets it, and that's that's really I think the commitment of traders is interpretive data, isn't it? It's like uh, people submit their views uh, on as you know what type of trader they are, whether they're a hedge yes. owner, whether they're an active participant, and that they're. And I think Chris as well was interpreting sentiment in terms of using Twitter. I think it was using social media. Yeah, it was. Yeah, absolutely. That was that they were his channels. Yeah, and he was working out what that meant in the real world yeah from that noise in those channels yes yeah and some of it was he would then go and wait outside the shop and think oh yeah look i can see it. i can see it physically going on because there's there's people queuing up for whatever or doing whatever um and making a noise about it so in in, in the social media world and i think both of those people they're they're bothered to pay attention to the things that's slightly more difficult to get your head around perhaps you know, it's rather than just looking at a chart that's every day and making a call, it's them digging into the weeds of what really happens in terms of human behavior and economies and thinking and actually working it out in Jason's sense that there's too much in this trade. In Chris's, that no, no one is even seeing this trade was the Chris Camillo approach. He was getting in into way, a trade before things happened. In a way, they're looking at disconfirmations. Something's disconfirming, something's not. You know, people are queuing outside these shops, but no one's buying this stock. You know, well, that's right. Like, yes, no, exactly. No right one's looking at that. Something, something doesn't fit, yeah. or uh, you know, um... we'll return to the podcast shortly. First, a few words about our podcast sponsor, the Society of Technical Analysts, and their brilliant home study course. Now, there's many ways to learn technical analysis. You can read books about it. You can watch short YouTube videos about it. But there's nothing quite like learning it from the leading experts. And that's what this course is all about. It's been developed and brought to you by the Society of Technical Analysts, which are a non-profit organization and have been going for over 50 years. And they run a brilliant diploma program. And that program has been devised by some of the best technical analysts in the world. Now, if you're serious about learning about price action methods and how they can help you become a better trader or someone who uses price action methods to devise and build systems, then this course is what you want. If you want to learn about analysis, technical analysis that is, or price action methods from a five minute YouTube video put together by someone who's probably never done the job for a living, that's fine. Go knock yourself out. But if you're serious about learning about technical analysts, give this course a check out. You can go to the STA website, technicalanalyst.com, or you can go to our website, alpha-mind.net, and you can have a look at the course on there. And if you do it through us, there is a £100 sterling discount on the full cost of the course. Now, the course isn't cheap, but that's because it is a proper course. Anyway, I'll leave it up to you. Now, back to the podcast. Okay, so, so Mark, what's, what's your next what, what, what do you? What is it you want to explore next, really? Well, I just want to add to that previous bit, which is the comment that Adam Burkett made. And of course, Adam, um, global trading lead for Cargill Ocean Transportation, who we've done some great, great work with that's been published on LinkedIn. Um, and Adam, re really critical message that, that not knowing is okay. I think that's really important and it goes back to you know collecting information and where we where we get our decisions from and actually want wanting to know everything is a state that a lot of people don't you know we kind of want to know everything what am i missing actually there's a point where you need to kind of guess be comfortable with the fact there's a lot of stuff you're not you're not going to know 
Um, because if you do get stuck into this loop of wanting to know everything, then you start your your time is getting owned by somebody else apart from you. You know, the market's owning you. Um, your your edge is disappearing because you may be not pulling the trigger on something because you've just got this desire to to know everything, um, which is impossible, which increases your stress, increases frustration, and it just totally messes up things like trade entry. So I think just calling out from out from that very good conversation we have with Adam, there's loads more within it than just that, but not knowing is okay. Not knowing is okay. Um, whilst being wrong is okay too. Um, but I think the not knowing bit just fits into what we've talked about in the last um, 20 minutes or so. I also yeah, got- completely, completely gels with that. Mm. You know, that idea of Jason Shapiro of, you know, do you want to make money or do you want to be right? Exactly, exactly. Hello. <laughs> yeah, Hello. These are super experienced people. Audience, listen to the experienced people. Because you'll pick up. Oh, Adam, Adam, Adam Burkett leads a team of 80 traders around the world. Yeah. One of the largest trading firms, commodity trading firms in the world. Mm. Um, and he's been doing it for 25 years and yeah. literally billions of dollars of freight goes through his business, his trading business, on a almost on a daily basis. Yes, yeah, so that was a podcast well, about six six months ago now, wasn't it? Or was it September? Well, well you know, it was in, in the sort of late summer. But, oh, it you know, it, it, it's it's hearing these people. This, this is what I mean. Invaluable. I, I, I'm, I'm going to big up, big us up here. This is why we love doing this and talking to these people yeah. and bringing them to our audience and why they love what we talk about. Because it's... It, it's trading it's in the pure it's in the you know these are people who have been there done it you know not not you know do it every day and have survived and as, as adam said you know, he was very honest as well another very humble person you know he'd he'd been beaten up really mm-hmm. badly mm-hmm. you know and and I, I don't think we've met the trader yet who hasn't to talk about it as well I, I, I think if you're listening to this yeah as a trader and you know you're you're having a bad run or you're still affected by a bad run you know you're no different to every other trader in the world who's ever been and ever will be you know i remember reading about jim simons you know the greatest trader ever okay and in his early years before he developed his systems he was literally feeling sick at some of the positions he was running and the way it made him feel you know, um, yeah. that's, that's what trading is. Well, we can all resonate with so, it. It's, it's tough. Yeah. Can we go back to the, the importance of Louisa Nicola's sort of strategy around, you know, getting yourself resilient and strong enough to cope with the fact that, you know, trading is not, not an easy game and it's going to be, yeah, it has, it has and, the and possibility that's, of damage. That's the thing. If, if you're physically looking after yourself and eating well and sleeping well, you're, you're, Cope with these incredibly deep setbacks so much better. Yeah, exactly. But they may not even get you. You might respond to them in the best way. You know, some of some of my best trading days when I go back to my career were days where I should have lost a lot of money, but only ended up losing a, lo- a little bit of money. Mm. And and that's because I, I was at my best on those days, and I was wrong, but I was at my best in how I dealt with it. Um, and they felt like big wins <laughs> those days, as opposed to other days where I was actually right and would end up hardly making anything and feeling really crap about myself. No, well, that um, goes just nicely on to what I want to mention next, yeah. which is that there are far too many people out there looking at the entry point of the trade and not enough people out there looking at the exit, the, the journey of the trade and the variation of the trade within that journey and the exit point of the trade and their own state of effectiveness throughout that journey. Okay. There's too many think- people thinking about the entry point and there's not enough people thinking about the whole package of a trade, the journey of it and how you get out of it. Like you just said, you know, you, you had, you had a massive loss, but you were in the right physiological or mental state to turn a massive loss into a small loss, and that might have been one of the best trades you've ever done because you, yep. you pulled it back, right? But it was the exit of that trade and getting out of it that was the important thing that you managed through your experience 
rather than just the fact that I've decided to go long of it, right? And certainly if there's yeah. too many people focused upon the entry um, and learning about how I enter the trade, or I get in trade, what's my signal, da, 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 rather than learning all this stuff that we talk about through our podcasts and through our work with these significant, um, you know, players of, of the, uh, the marketplace is that there's more than just the entry. You've got to work out your, your various states during the journey of the trade. And then the getting out of it, you know, okay, you might have a stop in, but there's all sorts of other things that would be going on that should be you managing where you get out of a trade. And not enough people are paying attention to that. that that's the bit where I love that, that quote by Mike Tyson. Everyone has a plan until they get hit in the face. Yep. Yep, it's exactly that. As a trader, you will show your skill after you've got hit in the face and everyone gets hit in the face. That's when the great traders really show up. And that's what people are not learning what to do. No. They're learning to find a winning trade. They're not learning how to manage their way through a trade. No. No. And that's the difference. But the job is not analysis. The job is trading. Yeah. The yeah. job is not find a winning trade. The job is manage risk. Correct. So there's the job not is not enough to trade on. It's stay with it and get out when you're right, when things are right. At the you don't know where the right moment is, you know, but get out optimally. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a big message. A big message for people looking to, you know, improve themselves. Just, you know, ask yourself that question, really. You know, you know, I need to, well, just get yourself into the mindset of thinking, I need to do more about that. We know that it's, it's a common problem. I think it's something that um, we'd like to reinforce as a message for those out there that are listening to this for a bit of wisdom. I'd say, yeah, pay, pay as much of a, much attention to the exit strategy as you pay to the entry strategy of a trade. Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to perhaps end on Todd Simkin, uh, Susquehanna, global head of learning and being portfolio manager and all sorts of things and futures trader back in the day. Um, he said, great traders are made not born as one of his quotes and i think that reflects on the thing that you know treat treat this as a learning journey um you know don't just think oh I, i'm i'm not a trader i can't do anything about it actually just keep learning there, there are lots of things out there to read um and you know build up this knowledge portfolio of understanding how others are approaching it. And we've given away a few things today with this, with Chris Camillo and, and, and Jason, and all those things are readily available on podcast for you to hear even deeper things. Uh, and, and, and Todd himself reveals more in his podcast. But it's really important for that message to be understood. Great traders are made, not born. So pay attention to physiology, pay attention to your learning, understand your weaknesses, be vulnerable, Know that being wrong is okay. Know that not knowing is okay. Um, all those things that you don't often read in books, although you might read some of them in Steve Goldstein's new book coming out, um, which we both had, well, Steve, Steve, predominantly. Did I mention uh, that? Did, his, did I mention gem. I think it's really, really important. It Mastering the Mental Game of Trading coming out next month on the 16th go. of January. Available in book form, Kindle and Audible. <laughs> There you go. There you go. I probably haven't mentioned it. Because your workout is the subtle things. It's the patience. It's the mindset. It's the discipline. It's the recovery. It's the management of your self worth through the turmoil of whatever's there. And actually understanding that you that you ne never stop learning. But if you do tune in. Well, you, you, Mark, Mark you're, you're sitting there with your golf jacket and golf hat on. <laughs> and, and, you know, what you're saying there. Could almost be summed up in, in in probably one of my favorite phrases from a sport which is that golf is a six inch course played between the left ear and the right one exactly that exactly that or, no the, no that's not the right is it i think it's the toughest the toughest golf course in the world is the six inches between your run from your left ear to your right one yeah yeah, yeah. and just, you know i've i'm relearning golf again I'm, I'm down with the local pro I thought I was good until I realized I'm doing like so many things wrong. 
um, because I'm accepting some degree of vulnerability and saying, I can be better. And I want to go to someone that knows better, that's had the experience of being in the world of golf, to understand how I need to up my game. And it's the same for this world of trading. When you're tuning in to people that you want to listen to and pay attention to, then actually it's people like us that have got like 70 years of experience that that are calling in people with massive experience into our conversations. And we're developing programs for, for massive global trading companies. We're the people that you need to listen to because actually you'll start to pick up the realities of how you can optimize both yourself, you know, your processes, your your way of doing things by calling upon, you know, the, the wisdom that we're sharing through these podcasts. Invest in yourself. What you're doing as a golfer there is you're investing in your in yourself as a golfer. You're accepting that you could be better. Yep. Okay. And you've gone back and you run I want to learn from somebody else. Yeah. You're never too old to learn. You're never too experienced to learn. You're never too old to be challenged. Um, and we don't come into this job ever, uh, you know, in trading. And we never reach a point where we can't learn and become better. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I talk about this often with people. Okay. You know, and, and as men, we, we, we're, we're a weird, we're weird creatures because I know most of this audience is, is made of men. Okay. We've done a little survey. Okay. And, you know, we do have quite a few women listen. We know some brilliant women traders. Um, we have wives of traders. We've been told, listen and enjoy the show. Um, so they, they may recognize this thing. How often, as a man, when you're driving along in your car, in the days pre-sat-nav, would your wife say to you, you're lost? And you say, no, I know where I'm going. And she say, pull over and ask someone. And you wouldn't do it. I, I wouldn't do it. I was, that, I was that man. Men, for some reason, hate to ask for help, hate to ask for direction, hate to ask for support. And I think it's a phys- it, it, it's something in our makeup. We like to think we can do it ourselves, and it's a failure to ask for support and help. Um, and yet, some of the most brilliant traders that that work with me and Mark that approach us for coaching, you know, they're at the very top of their game. You know, thirty years run run large hedge funds. They come to us for coaching, and. It, it, you know, I'm still amazed that they do that. But then I shouldn't. That's what makes them great. They're never afraid to ask for help. They're never afraid to be challenged. A little bit like you with a the golf. They never think they had a finished article. They recognise there is always something to learn. And and you know, I often like to point out that, you know, people like, you know, Novak Djokovic, you know, Roger Federer, the you know, even at the height of his success. They don't stop having coaching. Mm. They don't suddenly tell their coaches to go, I'm okay now, I don't need you. And that's the same for any great athlete or sportsman. You know, and so I, I, what I'm saying, and I think what Mark is saying there, is take the time to invest in yourself. You know, whether it's with a coach, whether it's on a course, whether it's, you know, um, stepping away, um reading books time invest time you know stepping away reviewing what you do you know learn you know we 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 advertise the society of technical analysis um home study course um you don't know everything and it's always great to put yourself out there and be challenged and allow yourself to find out new things about yourself and new things about this job and new things about how you turn up for this job. I mean, what, what, again, what are you learning about yourself as a golfer? Well, I mean, crumbs that it's just gone so wrong in the past because of you know, the wrong swing. I even managed to convince my wife to buy me a putter for Christmas, which was uh, getting, getting her on site <laughs> to uh, my my improvement. But I think it's just it's just eye opening, really. Um, 
and quite gobsmacking at times as to just how wrong I've been yet still being you know, what I consider to be a pretty good golfer. Um, and yet finding out that there were some subtleties, some real subtleties of a swing within a swing that I was just totally unaware of. Um, and I think, and it's because I found the right coach as well. I found, I found someone that I could resonate yeah. with that had the right experience uh, that understood me, um, that wanted to be careful and considerate and how they spoke to me and how, how they got me to practice and to stay with it. You know, that's part of it, right? And I think it's finding the right finding the right person to start with to set you on a journey of relearning or extending learning um, is what's really, really important, which is, you know, to some extent why we're, why we're quite popular in the coaching space. Um, and I think um, that's not by accident because say, yeah, 70 years of Marcus experience yeah, people, people trust us. And I think it's having trust in someone that's really important too. You know, the trust has got to be both ways. But uh, yeah. Yeah. And find mentors as well. That's another thing. Yeah, I say. mean. Find mentors. I, you know, I, I guess. People doing the job. They yeah. sit within the same camp, to be, to be honest, you know. Um, yeah. But again, find, find people that really, really, really know what they're talking about rather than mm. pretend to know. Because there's a lot of pretenders out there, yeah. so we just uh, again go do the sort of the uh, Jason Shapiro and put a bit of a filter on who you listen to because you might be listening to the wrong people. Well, listen, Mr. Randall, Mark Randall, from host to guest. Oh, that's good, How's that been? Thank you. That's all right. That's all right. I just pretended the mic wasn't there. <laughs> well, listen, just rambled on as usual. Listen, I'm, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna bring this to a close. But in all seriousness, I just want to say that Mark Randall is a fantastic coach um, out there for people who who want to think about how they do the job, how they turn up, um, how they, you know, holistically, everything they do in their work is open to challenge. I'm not, we're not talking here about really the technical aspects of what you do, but, you know, the 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 the, the, the physical, mental, psychological you know neurological side of your process everything that goes into it that you turn up at that job is can probably be improved and and mark is one of the best people out there and you could be co contacted mark at mark at alpha-mind.net can't you i can okay or That's on your dms start. on twitter alpha my at alpha mind 102 mind 102 yeah yep yeah. Um, my now and then tweet it would not it, it would be the best use of your time and investment really um i know that i'm not you know i'm speaking here as someone who's known mark for many years and know what he brings to people um so do think about it but listen mark thank you for your time today pleasure and um pleasure and um I leave this as a as a message you know happy new year to everyone um yeah go go get learning Absolutely. Take nothing for granted. Good luck to everyone in 2024. <laughs> thank you for listening to the Alpha Mind podcast today. We also want to extend a thank you to our podcast sponsor, the Society of Technical Analysts. Do check out their brilliant home study course, and you can see more about that at our website, alpha-mind.net. And of course, if you're keen to know more about how Alpha Mind can help you, please do also look up... Um, Further details of our services on our website or reach out to us at info at alpha-mind.net. That just leaves us to say thank you and we wish you the best of luck in the weeks ahead.